Welcome. Good afternoon. If you're in uh, Eastern Standard Time Zone. On behalf of the Jesuits of Canada, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our second webinar, A Mission of Reconciliation and Justice in Israel-Palestine Today. We will begin as always with a land acknowledgement. Let us begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on the virtual platform, let us take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which many of us call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous issues, people, and cultures. In Canada, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and commit each in our own way to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. There are a couple of housekeeping items to address before we get started. The session will be 90 minutes and uh, after the presentation, there'll be time for questions and answers. Please put those in the chat box. Uh, the recording of the session will be sent to all registered participants within 72 hours. Uh, Jose Sanchez, our Director of Communications, will take a moment to speak about translation and other technical issues. Merci, Pat. Uh, uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, welcome, everyone. For this part, I'll switch to French just to explain how to access the language of your choice. Alors, si tu vous êtes sur un ordinateur, Dans les commandes de votre session, cliquez sur le bouton Interprétation et après cliquez sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Si vous êtes sur un appareil mobile, dans le contrôle de votre réunion, appuyez sur euh, le bouton avec euh, les trois petits points au plus et après appuyez sur l'interprétation, le bouton Interprétation de la langue. Et finalement, appuyez sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Il y a deux choix, l'anglais et le français. Et c'est important de se souvenir que l'interprétation linguistique n'est pas disponible lorsque vous accédez, vous, vous accédez à Zoom sur un navigateur web. Finally, like uh, Pat said, please remember to enter your questions in uh, the uh, question and answer or through the question and answer button, also at the bottom or top of the screen, depending on your device. And questions will be answered uh, towards the end of the session. Um, a recording of the session will be shared with you by 72 uh, or three business days, uh, 72 hours or three business days after the event. And if you have technical technical problems, feel free to reach out to me through the chat box. You'll see the choice to speak to hosts and panelists. You can reach out to me and I'll help you out. Thank you, Pat. It is my pleasure to introduce Father David Newhouse. David Mark Newhouse is a member of the Society of Jesus. He teaches scripture in various institutions in Israel and Palestine. He completed a BA, MA, and a PhD in political science at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He then completed pontifical degrees in theology and scripture in Paris and Rome. He is Emeritus Latin Patriarchal Vicar for Hebrew-speaking Catholics in Israel and Coordinator of the Pastoral Among Migrants and Asylum Seekers in Israel. There's been a lot of interest in this topic. We have participants logged in from around the world, South Africa, Zambia, Israel, Palestine, the United States, Belgium, Italy, London, and of course, Canada and numerous other countries. Thank you for being with us, David. Thank you very much, Pat. <clears throat> As Pat said, this is the second of the sessions that we are having on the subject of Israel-Palestine. And I will use the same format, seeing as nobody threw tomatoes at me last time or rotten eggs, I will introduce now a 
a PowerPoint presentation and we will follow it through the duration of my talk. And then afterwards, there will surely be time for questions. So I begin now with the PowerPoint. So again, a mission of reconciliation and justice in Israel, Palestine today. Last week, we dealt extensively with the history of the conflict going back all the way to 1917. And we traced the, the conflict step by step until we reached today. Today, I want to focus on today and where we are going. So I have given it the title, Where We Are, and where we might be going. And I think a good place to start, we already got into this a little bit last week in the question and answer session, is to begin with some statistics in order that we can have a good grasp of what exactly we're talking about from a human point of view. Please note, that's why I put in the little addition, the statistics for Israel were published today, the 20th of September, 2022, that is the tradition to publish statistics before Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. In fact, demography is a part of the conflict as Jews and Palestinians, Israeli Jews and Palestinians of all different religions, they actually compete with demography and demography is very much a part of the conflict. So let's run through the demography as it stands today. As of today, according to the Central Bureau of Statistics in the State of Israel, there are 9,593,000 Israeli citizens. These citizens are divided into two groups, Jews, Jewish Israeli citizens of the State of Israel, just over 7 million, again, statistics published today, 7 million and 69,000. And Palestinian Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel, number 2 million and 26,000. Please note, of course, that I'm talking here about Palestinian Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel, descendants of those Palestinian Arabs who after 1948 either stayed in their homes or became refugees within the state of Israel uh, called internally displaced people. But these are people who are citizens, therefore have the vote. And so we have just over nine and a half million Israelis. Notice please that the Israelis count among this population Palestinian Arabs who live in Jerusalem, and those who were with us last week will remember that East Jerusalem is not a recognized part of the state of Israel, but rather part of those territories that Israelis occupied after the 1967 war. So those 360,000 more or less Palestinian Jerusalemites will appear both in the Israeli statistics for Israel counts them as part of the Israeli population, but they will also appear in the Palestinian population because they live in territories that according to international law are part of the Palestinian territories. And on the other side, in Palestine, that state that the Holy See recognizes and many other countries recognize, but which does not yet exist as a fully sovereign state, there are 5,378,000 Palestinian Arabs. Later, we will talk about to what extent are the Christians present both in Israel and in Palestine as citizens, both in Israel and in Palestine. And as you see there, I put Palestinian Jerusalemites, again, a population that has been counted twice because both of these entities claim those Palestinians that live in Jerusalem. Please notice it's very important to notice, and it's not clear from what I've written on the screen, that Jews, Israeli Jews, or Jewish Israelis, and Palestinian Arabs are almost equal in number. Just over 7 million 
on both sides, 7 million Jewish Israelis, 7 million Palestinian Arabs, some of whom are citizens of the state of Israel. The vast majority are resident in the occupied territories, living in entities that are called A, B, and C, which I explained last week. I have added in small print, and that's also important and an important part of the conflict, that the 7 million Palestinians who remain in Palestine are part of a much larger Palestinian population. There are Palestinians in the world, 13 million Palestinians. And so we are talking about around 6 million Palestinians who live in exile, diaspora, in the surrounding Arab countries or all over the world. After the 1948 catastrophe, the Nakba, seen from a Palestinian point of view, many, many, many Palestinians and their descendants are no longer able to live in their homeland. And on the other hand, the Jews in Israel, who number now just over 7 million, are part of a larger Jewish population in the world. And I've put here the number around 16 million. Of course, very problematic to number how many Jews there are in the world, because we are not exactly sure how to define what it means to be Jewish. This figure of around 16 million adopts a very conservative definition, which is the rabbinic definition, meaning Jews are some, a Jew is someone who is born to a Jewish mother or has converted to Judaism. Of course, if we counted Jews according to whoever considers him or herself a Jew, the number would be much greater. I think it's good to start with this. And I think also in the discussion that will follow, it will be good to keep in mind that in Israel-Palestine today, there are just over 14 million people who are permanently residing in this territory. Half of them are Jewish Israeli and half of them are Palestinian Arab. That is an important factual basis for the discussion that will follow. Now, I'd like to say a word about who the stakeholders are when we are talking about the present and future of this territory. And again, you see that I've kind of arbitrarily, arbitrarily divided the population already in my description into two groups, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs. I'd like to run through three groups on each side that would cover the majority, the vast majority of these two populations. So Israeli Jews, I start with them. Many, many Israelis would see themselves as secular Zionists, secular meaning they do not practice very much a religion. Yes, they are Jewish, but Zionism, remember, is the Jewish national movement. And this is something that many people abroad make a mistake about because they think that when they talk about Jews, they are talking about a religion. But in fact, Many Jews, perhaps even a majority of Jews in the world today, see themselves as secular, not practicing any form of traditional Judaism. But rather, they would insist that their Jewish identity is a national identity. And you will remember last week that I described Zionism as it developed from the late 19th century into the 20th century, and I defined it according to a few points. The first point is the recognition that there is a Jewish problem living spread around the world in what Jews call the diaspora. Jews have often been treated very badly, treated with contempt, and so they find themselves in a quandary. There is a Jewish problem. The Zionists propose that there is a solution to that problem, and that is to migrate from the countries of the diaspora, and not to migrate to any place, but to migrate to one particular place, and that is what the Zionists call the land of Israel, or what would be historical Palestine. To migrate there, and not only to arrive and to set up residence in this land, but to claim a state, a sovereign state. These four points, Jewish problem, migrate to 
Palestine to the land of Israel and create a state there would be a minimal definition of Zionism. And I think that all secular Zionists or the vast majority of them would agree that that's what they hold. Again, a very large part of the Israeli Jewish population are secular Zionists, are close to half of the Israeli population see themselves as Jews without being practicing, practicing meaning observing commandments or living, uh, living in any kind of coherent way according to Jewish religious practice. Another very big part of the Israeli Jewish population are religious Zionists, meaning yes, they are uh, Zionists, they see themselves as Jewish nationalists, but they would add the religious dimension. The religious dimension being, of course, practicing to whatever extent they do, Jewish religion, observing the Sabbath, observing the dietary laws, uh, uh, celebrating the feasts. Again, both populations, secular Zionists and religious Zionists, have nationalism in common, Jewish nationalism. And both of them refer to the Bible, interestingly. Of course, religious Zionists from a religious point of view, but secular Zionists also see their identity, their uh, claim to the land as founded in the biblical text. Interestingly, of course, a biblical text that would be read without too much reference to the main character who is God, but rather looking at the biblical text as a kind of historical narrative of this people and to a certain degree, a deed to the land. Now, alongside these two populations that make up the vast majority of Israeli Jews, I do want to mention that there is a population, an important population who plays an important role socially and politically, who we refer to as the ultra-Orthodox. Again, a distinction should be made between religious Zionists who might be orthodox in their religious practice, meaning they stick to Jewish tradition, but the ultra-Orthodox differ from the simply Orthodox because the ultra-Orthodox reject modernity and, at least in theory, also reject Zionism as a part of modernity. This means that they very strongly insist on their Jewish identity, but they see all forms of modernity, and many of them also see Zionism as something foreign to their lives, and they have not, to some extent, bought into uh, the secular state, Zionism as an ideology, they lived their lives strictly within the parameters of the Jewish religion. They too have come to live in the state of Israel, very often because they had no choice when they came in the 30s and 40s, many of them, or continue to come because they see a religious uh, virtue in living in the land of Israel. But again, they have their own agenda and their agenda often does not match the agenda of Jewish nationalism, but is rather an agenda that focuses on the preservation of their very traditional lifestyle. Again, we are making hefty generalizations, but I think that these three outlooks, secular Zionism, religious Zionism, and ultra-Orthodoxy cover the vast majority of the population with a lot of diversity within each group, but nonetheless, uh, that would tell us a little about who the stakeholders are in this conflict. On the Palestinian side, I'll do a similar uh, breakdown and say that there are secular nationalists, meaning Muslims and Christians whose nationalism is a nationalism that seeks to establish a secular state where Palestinian Arab rather than Muslim Christian or any other kind of religious identity would be at the fore. Secular nationalists uh, would be divided into many different parties. But last week we talked about the birth of the Palestine Liberation Organization, probably the most important 
party among the secular nationalists or the most important organization that includes a whole slew of parties uh, founded in the mid 1960s with the man who became a kind of symbol of the Palestinian struggle, Yasser Arafat and Yasser Arafat's vision of the state that he sought to establish was a secular nationalist vision. But alongside the secular nationalists, there are also religious nationalists. And when I say religious nationalists, we are now talking about the religion of the vast majority of Palestinians, which is Islam. So a kind of Muslim vision of the state, many of them influenced very much by resurgent Islamic movements that were born at the end of the Ottoman Empire in the 1920s, movements that we might have heard of, like the Muslim Brotherhood, which in some, to some degree is the, <clears throat> the foundation of what also was established in Palestinian political life in the 1980s, the Islamic resistance movement known by its acronym as Hamas. And then again, there is a whole slew of other religious uh, nationalists who have differing visions of what Palestine should look like. Again, please notice uh, that in, to some degree we have mirror images here, secular nationalists, both among Israeli Jews and among Palestinian Arabs and religious Zionists, both among Israeli Jews and among Palestinian Arabs with a huge diversity in both of these blocks. And finally, alongside secular nationalists and religious nationalists, I have added Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel who can be secular nationalists or religious nationalists, but have that very uh, important specificity of being citizens of the state of Israel and therefore, therefore participants in the political life of the state of Israel with huge challenges, but they do not live under Israeli occupation. Rather, they live in a regime of inequality because they are, as they are referred to, non-Jewish citizens of a state that is defined as a Jewish state. So again, uh, a lot of diversity with different visions of who we are right now or where we are right now and where we are going. Goals are the goals of the different stakeholders. So I think everybody wants peace. I've never met anyone who says, I don't want peace. But of course, everybody's vision of peace is very, very different. And I put it in the first place because the international community is the one who has made this the priority somehow to bring about peace in this situation of conflict, somehow to get Israelis, Jewish Israelis for the most part, and Palestinian Arabs to talk to one another in order to reach peace agreements. And last week we did a kind of history of some of the attempts to, and I'll use a strong word, impose peace on the region. Again, this seems to be number one concern for the international community. Again, I have not met people, Palestinian Arabs or Israeli Jews who say, we don't want peace. But there's a very big difference between saying we want peace and being willing to make the compromises in order to bring peace about. Goal number two, security. And again, of course, everyone wants security. But security is a refrain that one hears principally from, Israeli, from Jewish Israelis. Our security meaning we want to live lives where we can be free of fear. The fear of war, the fear of terrorism, the fear of disruption to our daily routine. And of course, Jewish Israelis see this as perhaps a number one goal and repeat that mantra very, very often. On the other hand, the Palestinians repeat a different mantra. They want justice. Again, possibly everyone will say we want justice, but justice is a burning concern for the Palestinians. Again, when we ran through 
the historical development, I pointed out that in fact, the Palestinians have not received any kind of parity with what Jewish Israelis have received since 1948. A Jewish state was established in 1948. That Jewish state was able to conquer all the remaining parts of Palestine. And again, maybe here, because we're talking about justice, I'll run through the statistics I talked about. Uh, the United Nations made it a legitimate state by dividing the country in 1947, 56% for the Jews, 44% for the Palestinians. The Jews accepted, but then the borders were set in 1949, not according to the United Nations partition plan, but according to the war that broke out immediately after the partition plan was published. And that war left a, a, a Jewish population with control of 78% of the territory on which the state of Israel was established. The other 22% were occupied by Jordan, who annexed that territory, the West Bank to Jordan, and occupied by Egypt, the Gaza Strip. So again, justice, justice is a very strong cry among the Palestinians. And I add equality, because I think that there is a growing population that sees that one of the very great struggles for people living in Israel-Palestine is equality. And I would even go further and say that I think that the Palestinian Arabs who are citizens of Israel, who want peace and security and certainly justice as well, more than anything else, they want equality in a struggle for their civil rights within the state of Israel. What are the possibilities? What kind of possibilities are laid out when we speak about a political solution to this conflict? So number one, and I think a vast majority <clears throat> um, of people think in ethnocentric terms, some Israelis, and here I will define them as right-wing Israelis, whether they are secular or religious nationalists, would like to see a state of Israel that controls the whole territory, 100% of historic Palestine. Again, I remind you last week, we talked about settlement activity, moving Israeli civilian population into the occupied territories, territories that are not recognized as part of the state of Israel and building their towns and villages known as settlements, which then become home to a Jewish population and constitute a very important obstacle to any future partition of the territory. Some of those people who support settlement activity see Israel as one ethnocentric state, meaning one Jewish state. Of course, there are many people who fear that, saying that state cannot, will not be democratic. Again, remember, 7 million, 7 million. And an ethnocentric state means in all the territory, there will be a Jewish state that is run by a Jewish, uh, not even a, ma a majority, half the population. I will add that among Palestinians, there are also those who dream of one ethnocentric state. I believe that they are a minority, but an important minority. They would like to see all of historic Palestine under Palestinian control. Yes, they recognize, almost all of them, that that means there will be a Jewish population living in a Palestinian Arab state, and at least they recognize the rights of those Jews who have always been in Palestine. But in very ideological fashion, they deny the right of Jews who might have moved to Palestine during the Zionist um, encouragement of migration to Palestine. And so one ethnocentric state is certainly a proposition out there, not one that many in the international community would feel comfortable with. The major proposition of the international community is since the partition of Palestine in 1947, the plan by the United Nations to divide 
Palestine into a Jewish state and a Palestinian Arab state is that in this territory, there would be two ethnocentric states. Again, I say ethnocentric because one state would be the homeland of the Jewish people and the other would be the homeland of the Palestinian Arab people. This does not mean that there will not be people who are not Jewish living in the Jewish state and people who are not Palestinian Arab living in the Palestinian Arab state. And here we would run into again problems of to what extent would the rights of those who are not Jewish in the Jewish state and not Palestinian Arab in the Arab state, to what extent would their rights be guaranteed? To what extent would these two ethnocentric states be democratic? This is a huge challenge, a challenge that is very well argued in the state of Israel, which claims officially to be both Jewish and democratic. Of course, the extent to which Israel is a democracy can be gauged by the reactions of the citizens in Israel who are not Jewish and to a very large degree feel like second class citizens. This though is the proposal of the international community. That includes the Holy See that has over and over again stressed that like the rest of the international community, the best solution for the conflict is to have a state of Palestine alongside a state of Israel, two states living in peace with each other. There is a, an important small minority of people, very few Israeli Jews, perhaps many more Palestinian Arabs, and in particular Palestinian Arab Christians who promote a democratic state one state in historical Palestine, but a state that will neither be dominated by Zionism nor by Islam, but rather will be a secular state, a state of all its citizens. This again is a huge debate within the present political uh, uh, conglomerations that exist in the state of Israel. And so here we see the three most important possibilities, an ethnocentric state that would be all Jewish or all Palestinian. And many of the religious nationalists among the Palestinians uh, would like to see this, even though it's very unlikely. An international community and many among Jewish Israelis and Palestinian Arabs, who at least in theory, think that two states for two people, meaning two ethnocentric states, each one for its uh, population would be the best solution. But there are, and I think it's a growing number of people today who say, no, we don't want ethnocentricity. We would prefer some kind of democracy. Again, talking about possibilities does not mean that this actually is the situation right now. What we have right now is a Jewish state of Israel that controls almost all of the territory and little pockets of autonomy controlled by uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Arab secular nationalists with a more religious nationalism very prominent in the Gaza Strip. So that's what I'd like to say about uh, where we are and where we are going, although we are not going anywhere very fast right now. A word about the Christians, because I think that many people who are listening to me might want to know a little bit more detail about who are the Christians in this situation. So first thing, of course, notice the Christians are a very small group, both in Israel and in Palestine. I've put here on the screen, Christians in Israel form about 2.4% of the population. And I specify, Palestinian Arab Christians are, in other words, Christians who are Palestinian Arabs and citizens of the state of Israel number around 130,000, divided into many different Christian confessions. But of course, what they share is language, culture, history, and the challenges of being are Christian Palestinian Arabs in a Jewish state. They 
at least from a political, social, and economic point of view, live together with the majority of the Palestinian Arab population inside the state of Israel who are Muslims. Of course, there are also Druze and other religious groups. We won't go into that diversity right now. It might be important also to realize that within the state of Israel, there are Christian citizens who identify fully with Israel, who live as Jews in their socio-political, economic, and educational life. These Christians serve in the Israeli army, are and live like all Jews do. They are Hebrew-speaking Christian citizens of the state of Israel. Very few of them are, in fact, of Jewish origin. The vast majority of them have relatives or, for some other reason, have integrated into the population of Israel and are citizens. So we have around 170,000 citizens, Israeli citizens, who are Christian in a great diversity of denominations. And then I'll add, and this is true of all wealthy countries, and Israel is an affluent country, we have Christians who are not citizens. Notice very interestingly, more of them than of the other two groups, 150,000. These migrants are labor migrants, people who have come to work in Israel, and in many cases illegally have set up their lives here. The center of their life is here. Children are born here, but they do not have citizenship, and many of them are without documentation. In addition to that, we have a much smaller population of asylum seekers. Again, in many countries, these would be refugees, but Israel almost never gives refugee status to people who are not Jewish. And so we have populations from Africa, predominantly from Africa, also a little from Asia, from uh, Eastern Europe, of people who are asylum seekers. They had come into the state of Israel hoping to receive refugee status, but again, as I pointed out, only on very, very rare occasions does Israel recognize somebody who's not Jewish as a refugee. Let's move now to Palestine. And again, you'll know what I mean when I say Palestine. I'm talking about those territories that were occupied by Israel in 1967. Before 1967, the West Bank ruled by Jordan, the Gaza Strip ruled by Egypt. In these territories, there are about 50,000 Christians. Again, I'm including in this number of 50,000, around 10,000 Christian Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem that is not recognized as part of the Israeli state, but is defined by international law as occupied territories. Again, these Christians are Palestinian Arab Christians for the large majority, belonging to a variety of different churches. For those who'd like to know what are the predominant churches among the Palestinian Arab population, both in Israel and in Palestine, well, there are many Catholics, but not Roman Catholics. The biggest Catholic church would be the Melkite or Greek Catholic church, and then a very big, important population of Greek Orthodox although, of course, Greek refers to the right and not to the language, they being Palestinian Arabs. And then there are a whole slew of smaller churches, different Catholic rites, different Eastern churches, and very small communities of Anglicans, of Lutherans, and other Protestants, with also a growing presence, although still very small, of evangelicals among the Palestinian Arabs who are Christian, both in Israel and in Palestine. What, in fact, does the church propose? And so I've brought here a citation from Church Discourse. This was an interesting, very interesting visit in 2009 of Pope Benedict XVI. It was the third of four papal visits, again, 
I say, as I said last week, the first visit was in January 1964, when Pope Paul VI came to the Holy Land. He did not really acknowledge the modern reality of the Holy Land. He talked only in very obscure ways about the fact that there was a state of Israel that he entered, and there was a Palestinian Arab people waiting for a state. Then in 2000, Pope John Paul II came. And that was a whole different period because it was after the Holy See recognized the state of Israel and signed accords with the state of Israel. And also in the year that he came in 2000, the Holy See signed accords with the Palestine Liberation Organization. The Holy See has always tried to maintain a coherent, ethical, and Christian discourse about what goes on in the Holy Land. Then in 2009, Pope Benedict came, and in 2014, Pope Francis visited. Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis have done a kind of choreographed dance that takes them between Israelis and Palestinians, that takes them between Jews and Muslims, that takes them between a discourse that is very sensitive to Jewish history, to the need to struggle against anti-Semitism, which is a reality and has been in Christendom in particular, but also a commitment to justice for the Palestinians. And so this dance that has taken them is like a proposed bridge a bridge that the church at least is proposing in discourse. And so this state, this, this quotation from the discourse of Benedict XVI when he arrived at Ben Gurion Airport on the 15th of May, 2009, would not be anything very particular to Pope Benedict, but pretty much sum up what the Holy See proposes in terms of what would be the ideal solution to this conflict. And so Benedict said, in the presence of the Israeli president and uh, Israeli prime minister, let it be universally recognized that the state of Israel has the right to exist and to enjoy peace and security within internationally agreed borders. Notice there the peace first, really the goal of the international community, security, the real a concern of many Israelis that we could live in our homeland, in our Jewish state, in security. But then he adds immediately, let it be likewise acknowledged that the Palestinian people have a right to a sovereign, independent homeland, to live with dignity, and to travel freely. The word justice is not there, but when he says a right to a sovereign, independent homeland, and phrases that within, let it be likewise acknowledged, I think Benedict is underlining the cry for justice. And he ends, or rather this citation ends with, let the two state solution become a reality and not remain a dream. Again, this would be very much in line with the discourse of the international community the United Nations, the United States, and most of the governments of the world, a two-state solution. But I think that many Christians see that this is not happening. It should have happened, perhaps. Can it happen still with the extensive settlement building, with the intransigence on both sides? And in a remarkably courageous statement on the 20th of May, 2019, a statement called Righteousness and Peace Will Embrace Each Other, a citation from the Psalms, the local Catholic bishops of the Holy Land, meaning the Greek Catholics, the Roman Catholics, the Maronites, the Syrian Catholics, and the Armenians, signed a statement in which they said something daring. And this is what they said. We, 
And I think here they're not only talking about themselves, but rather Christians in the Holy, Holy Land. We promote a vision according to which everyone in this Holy Land has full equality. The equality befitting all men and women created equal in God's own image and likeness. Now, I think here we are touching upon something absolutely foundational to Catholic social doctrine, that we are all created equal in God's own image and likeness. Notice the stress here is not on security, not even on justice, but on equality. And they continue, the Catholic ordinaries, the bishops, we believe that equality, whatever political solutions might be adopted, one ethnocentric state, two ethnocentric states, a state that is uh, uh, founded on democracy and equality, but we believe that equality, whatever political solution might be adopted, is a fundamental condition for a just and lasting peace. Again, we can understand that equality on two different levels. One, that Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, Palestinian Arabs are equal. They have the same right to a state. But I think here, the bishops are also opening up the possibility. And I think many Christians, particularly Christian, Christians who are Palestinian Arabs, that perhaps what we need is one framework of a, a state that guarantees equality to everyone, whether they are Jews, Christians, or Muslims, whether they are Israelis or Palestinians, that we would live in a state that guarantees equality for all the citizens. I'd like to end with something that happened at the end or uh, after the visit of Pope Francis. Pope Francis came in 2014 to the Holy Land. Again, another remarkable visit, the fourth of the papal visits that we have experienced. And he brought some newness to the visit. I'd like to perhaps mention some of the things that he did that were particularly courageous. First of all, he announced that he was coming to visit Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. Yes, he dwelt upon the fact that we have here at least the dream of three entities, a Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, nobody disputes exists, a state of Israel, nobody disputes that it exists, but he insisted also on phrasing, enunciating the expression, the state of Palestine. In fact, when he met with Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who is the man here with the glasses next to him, the president of the Palestinian Authority, he began his words by saying, I am so delighted that such good relations exist between the Holy See and the state of Palestine. And he gave a particularly symbolic meaning to this future state or this embryonic state. He flew from Amman, from Jordan, right into the state of Palestine. He took a helicopter, uh, from the Jordanian Air Force and flew not through Israel into territories that are very much controlled by Israel, but straight into Palestine. Perhaps the most iconic image of the Pope's visit was the Pope as he stepped out of his Pope mobile and walked to the wall that has been built. We talked about that wall last week a wall that was built according to the Israelis for security. But I pointed out that that wall penetrates deeply into Palestinian territory and therefore to a large extent has been constructed to separate Palestinians from their land. It's a, a wall of division. And he stopped there for a moment to pray. It was not scheduled. And then he made his way to the uh, square in front of the Nativity Church and said something that was not in the official discourses. Of course, it was planned, but it was not what we had received as official discourse because there he invited President Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, and President Shimon Peres, 
who's standing on the other side of him, the Israeli state president, to come to the Vatican, to be part of an invocation for peace. After the visit was finished, this was to take place two weeks after he ended his visit. Of course, some asked, why didn't he pray for peace when he was there? Well, I think he was praying for peace all the time. But I think he wanted to take these two important political figures out of the fray and bring them into the gardens of the Vatican and there to join with them in prayer. And I'd like to share with you a part of what the Pope said, a very short address on the 8th of June, 2014. To a large extent, these words animate my own prayer for this land as the conflict goes on and on and on. Almost every day, people are killed. We don't even hear about them. Our people, for the, la for the most part, Palestinians who are gunned down in the cities of the West Bank and Israelis who live in fear and are attacked. The violence goes on and on and on and it seems that we are not yet ready for peace, security, justice and equality. And so this is what the Pope said at this invocation for peace. We know and we believe that we need the help of God. We do not renounce our responsibilities, but we do call upon God in an act of supreme responsibility before our consciousness and before our peoples. We have heard a summons and we must respond. It is the summons to break the spiral of hatred and violence and to break it by one word alone, the word brother, the word sister, I'm adding that. But to be able to utter this word, we have to lift our eyes to heaven and acknowledge one another as children of one parent God, I add that. And so I think that these words really put us into the spirit of where I hope we've arrived at after listening to the history of the conflict, and then where are we right now and where are we going? For indeed, we need the help of God in the very simple sense of raising our eyes to heaven and realizing that that God who we pray to, who Jews pray to, who Muslims pray to, who Christians pray to, is really the parent God of all the people of this land, including the parent God of our enemy. So I have ended the active part of the input and Patricia, if you like, we can go yeah. to the questions or Thank comments. You, Thank you very much, David. You've given us a lot to uh, think about and learn and absorb. Our first question is one that I think a lot of people would ask. When defending Palestinians and the need for a Palestinian state, how to best respond when I am being accused of being anti-Semitic? So this is a very complicated question, okay? I think that the first thing we need to say is that anti-Semitism is real. Okay, I think that we as Christians, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that anti-Semitism is a real phenomenon. And there might be vestiges of anti-Semitism in how we think, even perhaps how we act unconsciously. And I think this is very important. Okay, I don't think that anti-Semitism can just be uh, uh, brushed away. But, and this is a huge but, Anti-Semitism has been instrumentalized in order to silence any critics of the state of Israel. And you see here, I'm underlining a tension here. This is an incredible tension between a reality of anti-Semitism that we need to fight with all our might, uproot any vestiges of the teaching of contempt that was vehicled by centuries of Christian tradition. They killed Christ. They are blind. They are a stubborn people. God hates them. God has rejected them. 
all of these themes that have really been a part of Christian discourse, we must make sure that we have uprooted them and tossed them into the garbage pail of history. But at the same time, we must be very, very careful of this accusation of anti-Semitism or attempts to define anti-Semitism that are based upon critic criticism of the state of Israel or criticism of Zionist ideology. No, anti-Semitism means something very particular and has to do with the Jewish people. Criticism of the state of Israel, criticism of Zionism is absolutely legitimate, providing, of course, that it does not hype on anti-Semitic tropes. I have recently written an article, and if anybody would like, they can ask me and I'll send it to them. It was published in a journal of the Sabil Center, which is a center for uh, Palestinian liberation theology. And I argue in that, uh, in that article that this struggle against anti-Semitism and the struggle for justice for the Palestinian people are part of the same struggle. Those who really struggle against anti-Semitism, those who really struggle for justice for the Palestinian people are ultimately on the same side. And we do not need to see uh, each other as enemies, but rather together we are trying to build a better world. If the ultra-Orthodox are not political for the state of Israel, why do they have a vote and receive millions of shekels? <laughs> because they are citizens of the state of Israel, like any citizen. Uh, citizens do not have to buy into national agendas uh, to be uh, regarded as citizens. So I'm very delighted that they have a vote. I'm very delighted that they get a part of the national income. They contribute uh, to the country in whichever ways they contribute, like any other citizen. So I, I see them as integral to who we are as Israel-Palestine today and rejoice in their presence. Isn't a two-state solution largely impossible with the ever-expanding Israeli settlements? Israelis are now even building on E1, effectively cutting off Palestinians from Jerusalem. Yes. The, the settlements are no accident. They are intentional to make a Palestinian state impossible. So I agree that the, the settlements are definitely intentional. Settlement building began immediately after the 1967 war. All governments of Israel, whether they were socialist or right-wing governments of Israel, have contributed to settlement building. In fact, we might even point out that the supposedly peace governments, the socialist labor governments, have built more settlements than the right-wing governments who were heavily surveyed by the US administration. And definitely the attempt was to block the possibility of establishing a Palestinian state. So indeed, some say it's become impossible. Many who believe in one ethnocentric state, a Jewish state on, in all of our historical Palestine would say that, oh, you cannot uproot us. We are here, we are here to stay. And people on the left wing who say, well, what are we going to do with these huge uh, populations of settlers that have moved into uh, Palestinian territories, confiscated properties, and uh, set up infrastructure? Um, it depends to what extent the international community is convinced that a two-state solution needs to be uh, put in place. For example, uh, Israel in the past has evacuated settlements. They did so when they left the Gaza Strip. Now, of course, building is much more extensive in the West Bank, but some have proposed that leaving the settlements intact, leaving the buildings, the houses, the infrastructure, would be in some way to make up partially for what Palestinians lost in 1948. So again, there are creative ways of thinking through the situation, but certainly there are those who would agree with what that question has proposed it's already too late 
for a two-state solution. Is there any Commission for Peace working along with what the three popes have hoped or worked for? Is there any Commission for Peace? Yes. Yes. So we have in the Holy Land, uh, our, like in most dioceses, I would imagine, our Catholic dioceses, we have the Commission of Justice and Peace. This commission has been very active over many decades and very, very much influenced by one person who I think for many Christians is a very, very clear thinking, um, very engaged, very evangelical figure. And that was our, he, he was our Latin patriarch from 1987 until 2008. His name is Michel Sabah. He has spoken and written extensively on the conflict. And so indeed, yes, I have been a member of that commission for uh, the past 20 years or more. And so indeed, uh, we meet together, we discuss, uh, we try to work out what can we propose. And again, the most important thing for us is the question of discourse. How do we speak about what's going on? And I think that this has been the most important contribution of the four popes who have come to the land. Uh, how do we speak about Jewish Israelis? How do we speak about Palestinian Arabs? How do we speak about Muslims, Jews? How do we speak about local Christians? In our language, are we proposing a vision that takes us out of this dark situation into something that is more similar uh, to the kingdom of God we're all called upon to enter. Again, we are very small in number, but we have a very important role in society. We have schools, many schools. We have hospitals. We have social, social work uh, frameworks. We have homes for the handicapped, for orphans, for old people. Our presence in society goes way beyond our numbers. And I think that the challenge really is to create in our discourse a reality which is completely different from the one that we live in the hope that our words will become flesh, uh, that our vision, uh, respectful towards Jews, respectful towards Muslims, respectful towards the Israelis and what they hope for, respectful to the Palestinian Arabs and what they hope for, in our language, we would be able to really build uh, a reality that could take people to a new place. I do want to point out that my words are very, very, very much influenced by the fact that I was born in South Africa and that Nelson Mandela was able to create a discourse that allowed all South Africans to see a different future. We've had a couple of requests for the article you mentioned, David. So if you could send it to me, I'll- I will send it to you. Uh, I'll send it to you with the, uh, uh, with the details of where it was published so that people know uh, where it was published. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have hope for an equal two-state nation? If so, wherein does your hope lie? So I must be perfectly honest and say that I'm not one of those people who really believes in a two-state solution, not only because I think it's no longer practicable, not only because I think the Israelis, uh, the Israeli government has succeeded or the Israeli authorities have succeeded in sinking that option. But I do believe, uh, and I think that many Christians believe with me, many on the Justice and Peace Commission, for example, that the real struggle now is for equality. Whatever solution comes, if a two-state solution is imposed, the big, big question will be equality. Within these two states, are all citizens equal? Or if there is one state, will there be equality? This is the struggle to which I believe that I'm much more called to engage in than uh, fighting for some kind of uh, nationalism that I don't think will lead us out of the conflict, but might improve a little the situation if we had two states, but still too many people I would still be suffering from inequality. 
Is it true that the late queen has never visited Palestine or Israel? If so, why? It is true that the late queen never came to Israel-Palestine. I don't even think she came to Israel-Palestine before she became queen. Uh, um, there are those that say this was advice of the foreign office that she shouldn't get involved in this conflict. And by inviting people to come and see her, uh, it would be uh, more equitable. Indeed, at her funeral, uh, the Israeli state president was there, the Palestinian prime minister was there, and of course, many, many leaders from around the Arab world, the members of the Jewish community. Interestingly, members of the royal family have come, uh, have come to the state of Israel and have visited Palestine. And a little snippet of interesting trivia is that um, the Duke of Edinburgh's mother is buried on the Mount of Olives. Those who know her or don't, she had a very interesting life. She ended her days as an Orthodox nun and asked to be buried uh, on the Mount of Olives, very close to her aunt, who was also buried on the Mount of Olives. So the grave has uh, brought, or the tomb has brought members of the royal families also on a personal pilgrimage. I'll add again another little trivia that she, her name was Princess Alice of Greece, was recognized as a righteous among the nations, meaning that she saved Jewish people in her apartment during the Nazi occupation of Athens. And so the Duke of Edinburgh and one of his sisters were also came another time to Israel to be present and to plant a tree in her memory when she was awarded that title. A couple of years ago, I did a tour of Palestine. The guide was the son of refugees who live in refugee camps. He himself, now an adult, still lives in the refugee camp. He said the vast majority of people, Muslim, Jews, Muslims, Jews, and Christians in, in the Holy Land want peace. What is your experience? So I think I said that. I said, uh, when I ask people, do you want peace? I've never met anyone who said, no, I don't want peace. So I think everybody wants peace. But I added, not everybody is willing to make the compromises to enter into a listening process that will lead to real peace. And I think that it is here where language becomes so important. What does peace mean? It's not just a word to be bandied around. Okay, it's not a word uh, to be manipulated and, and uh, teased. Uh, I think that language creates the, the, the possibilities of speaking about peace in a real way. What does it mean? Okay, and I think that fundamentally it means that we all live on this land together. Now, again, I do believe uh, really, and this is my experience, I've been living here for 45 years, I do believe that most people sincerely want peace, but that's not the only thing they want, okay? When you want peace and security, peace gets thrown under the bus of security. When you want peace and justice, peace gets thrown under the bus of justice. And so, and for understandable reasons, huh? people are not willing to sacrifice their security for peace, but I don't think there's another way. Huh? People are not willing to sacrifice their just claims for peace. And again, I fully understand that. So it makes it very complicated. And I think we need therefore to talk about peace within the very real context of what that could possibly mean. And very few of our political leaders actually do that. On the coin of an Israeli shekel, there is a map of Israel that extends to the Jordan River. Have the, have the new borders of Israel been declared by Israel um, when they are changing daily? I'm not sure that that's 100% true, okay? I don't remember. I could grab out all my coins and have a look. But certainly there is an incredible ambivalence about borders, okay? An incredible ambivalence. Let's talk from, the, from one side about Israeli ambivalence. 
the internationally recognized borders of the state of Israel, those borders that were recognized in January 1949 and still constitute what are the internationally recognized borders of the United Nations and by the vast majority of countries around the world. Those borders exclude many of the most important religious sites that Jews see as integral to their identity as Jews. For example, the Western Wall, once upon a time called the Wailing Wall, is outside of those borders. The tombs of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the tomb of Rachel, um, all of these sites are outside. In other words, very much of the narrative of the Jewish connection to the land is with cities like Hebron, like East Jerusalem, like Nablus, that are not within mm -hmm. the internationally recognized borders of the state of Israel. And so on one level, there is an incredible ambivalence about those international borders. On the Palestinian side, there is also an ambivalence because, and I stated that at the beginning of the last session when we talked about history, this was all Palestine. Palestinians see Jaffa, Haifa as Palestinian cities where they lived for hundreds, if not thousands of years with their very important uh, buildings and, and tombs and shrines, okay? You think of Tiberias, you think of Safad. In those two cities, there are almost no Palestinians left today, but when you visit them, you cannot avoid seeing these were Palestinian cities. And under the forests, there are all the villages. Again, there's an incredible ambivalence. This is what peace will mean, uh, dealing with the reality of this ambivalence. And uh, again, uh, two states, one state, how are we going to deal with the fact that Jews, however Palestinians see them, and many Palestinians see the Jews who have come to Palestine as colonial settlers who should go back to where they came from, Jews see themselves as indigenous, okay? Jews who want here a Jewish state and see non-Jews as kind of extraneous, perhaps they shouldn't be here. Again, there's a huge ambivalence when it comes to these issues of borders, who actually belongs here. Um, I think that's where, again, very important to develop a language that is used pedagogically so that we can start describing the type of land that is and accept what is as a given rather than relying on religious imagination and, and uh, nationalistic mythology. In New York yesterday, there was a protest to support Palestine uh, led by ultra-Orthodox Jews. At the same time this week at the UN, Noah Tishi put forward a motion to censor online criticism of Israel because it is anti-Semitic. How do Jews the, it, within their own community live with these very different polarized views? And as my neighbor said, we never talk about circumcision or Israel. <laughs> So I think that this is, again, a reality of the Jewish world that some Jews find embarrassing, particularly are very convinced Zionists. Zionism has never had a complete Jewish uh, unanimity. Zionism has been very strongly debated. I pointed out last week that when Zionism was founded, I would say that the vast majority of Jews did not agree with Zionism. They saw as their goal integration in the countries in which they lived, fighting anti-Semitism in the countries in which they lived, struggling for equality. If you remember, I mentioned last week, even showed his photo, Edwin Montague, the minister uh, responsible for India, who was appalled by the Balfour Declaration because he said, what are you talking about my homeland? My homeland is England. Now, a lot of that was... Uh, went up in smoke at, in the gas chambers. Okay, a lot of that opposition to Zionism because we, we don't belong there, we belong where we are. But I think that today there are many Jews who are rethinking 
are Zionism. First of all, because they feel at home where they are. Uh, we have now the United States of America, uh, I, probably Canada as well, where Jews feel very much at home. And so much at home that both the United, well, the United States, I don't know about Canada, but the United States is home to a huge population of Jewish Israelis who have left Israel to live in the United States. It's secure. The security they seek, they might have found in Los Angeles or in New York. So that's one level of their discomfort uh, with a Zionism that, that uh, is saying the only place where a Jew should live is Israel. But there is a second level that troubles many Jews, uh, many, many Jews in Israel and also to a large extent in the diaspora. And that is the state of Israel might have, was supposed to be some kind of dream a democratic state giving security, but many Jews are profoundly troubled by the history of the state of Israel with the Palestinian people. They are troubled very strongly uh, by an Israeli government that has not really sought peace, has not really sought to make a place for Palestinians. And so, yeah, within the Jewish population, there's a huge debate. Uh, among the most important Jews of the 20th century with those who are on record saying, we are not comfortable with what's going on in Israel. I'll mention two, maybe two of the best known thinkers in the 20th century. Both of them were Zionists, but when they saw what was happening in 1947, 1948, 1949, they had severe reservations about an ideology that was now establishing itself through power and might. The two I'm talking about are Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, and Hannah Arendt, uh, the political philosopher. Both of them started off as Zionist, having seen what happened in Europe, and then slowly but surely became more and more critical of what was happening in Israel when they saw uh, the reality, the day-to-day -day reality of how Palestinians were treated. There are many Jews in Israel that work for peace and a two-state solution. The Torah speaks to how foreigners are treated in our land and that Jerusalem will vomit us out if we're not just. Um, why are, are Jews who are working for peace not out, out on the streets protesting every single time there's terrorism against the Palestinians? So I would say that I wish there were many, many, many Israelis. There are Israelis who are committed to peace and a number of them, people I know, spend an enormous amount of time out on the street protesting, okay? One example, the women in black who gather every Friday and they've been doing this since 1988, if I remember correctly. Every Friday they're out on the street saying, enough to the occupation, die le kibush, kaffa le lehtilal, are holding up signs and they're insulted and abused and they're very courageous, okay? I'm not sure uh, that the problem is not with all majorities to become absolutely insensitive to what is going on around them because might is right. Uh, they rule by the force of their, of their arm. There are, of course, people who have made a religious ideology out of racism and, and occupation and discrimination. They certainly are. But for the meantime, they are a minority. I'm very worried about the upcoming elections because among the different Israeli parties, there are too many of those parties, too many of those politicians who now speak a language that is clearly racist clearly using religion to justify oppression, discrimination, and occupation. But they're a minority. I think that the vast majority have become, they don't care anymore. I, when I was on the board of B'Tselem, one of the most important Israeli human rights organizations, we had a speaker come from Tel Aviv, a secular Jewish professor of law, and she said, don't make any mistake. The vast majority of, of Israelis are not against what you're doing, documenting human rights. The vast majority of Israelis simply don't want to know. 
They want to remain completely without knowledge so that in their lack of knowledge, they can continue life as normal. I know that reality also from white South Africa. Uh, it's not that the vast majority of white South Africans thought about black people all the time. They didn't want to think about black people. They completely ignored the oppression. And that's very true of many Israelis as well. We live in a society where really, if we want, we can know almost everything. There is very little censorship, but the vast majority of Israelis don't want to know. It's too difficult to live with that sense of we're in a human rights catastrophe. How can Ignatian values or ways of proceeding guide the work for justice and how do they orient you? So the favorite Ignatian word, ah, what would be the most favorite Ignatian word? Discernment, ah, listening, listening and then trying to help people discern. I think that this is really, I, I'm a teacher. I teach the Bible. I don't teach Ignatian spirituality, but I have this enormous privilege of teaching in Hebrew, teaching in Arabic, teaching many Christians, but also teaching many Jews and teaching Muslims. And the, ab and the ability, A, to formulate a discerning language, a language that really reflects on what am I putting out there with this real sense that our words create the world in which we live. God created the world with a word. We create the worlds we live in with our words. Uh, it, how, how, do I, how do I relate to Israelis? How do I relate to Palestinians? How do I think about them? How do I formulate who they are? So a discerning discourse, but then also trying to listen, uh, trying to listen and to help people discern by listening to them and really engaging with them on that level of what is it you're actually saying? Do you, do you put yourself behind those words or would you like to think again and reformulate? So again, for me, uh, a large part of the work that we can do as uh, Christians, as uh, teachers, as people of the word, uh, is to choose our words carefully and help others to choose their words carefully so that once again, the change can slowly start to take place in how we speak. We don't have guns, we don't have huge political influence, but we do have the word for which we can be responsible. And I think that that really, for me, uh, has helped me enormously in appreciating how important the word is uh, and a discerning word and helping others to discern their words. Is there a growing movement in younger diaspora Jews to support Palestine? So I think there is a growing division a growing division within the Jewish community in Israel and in Palestine and in the diaspora. A growing division based upon, uh, on the one hand, more and more ethnocentricity in some circles. In other words, we don't want to think about Palestinians, don't even mention the word. If you do, you're an anti Semite. There are those currents and they are very strong. But on the other side, uh, in the diaspora and to some extent in Israel, are those who are starting to understand what has happened in Palestine, what has gone on. Okay, very courageous Jewish young people coming, for instance, during the summer and going out to refugee camps, to Palestinian villages, to see up close, to see for themselves. So again, uh, I think that the growing reality is division about this issue. And that division might lead to a crisis and a crisis is always a moment to judge reality, or to really see why are we in this situation and what can we do about changing it? Uh, <clears throat> I think we have time just for one more question. The Israeli lobby here in Canada and in the United States yields enormous power in the government and in education. Is it possible to move forward with this 
um, power affecting all politicians. So undoubtedly, I believe that it is possible to move forward because there's no other way. Uh, what, what does not moving forward mean? We just give up? We can't give up. I think that it means that we need to put our message out there. Okay, I think in the United States, I don't, I'm sorry, I have to admit, I'm a little ignorant about what goes on in Canada, and I'm not very knowledgeable about what goes on in the United States. But I've noticed in recent years, that in the United States, there has been a shift. There has been a shift also, in the degree to which the Palestinian cause is eloquently put out there by members of Congress, but much more importantly, Look at Netflix, okay? Everybody, well, I, I don't know, maybe not, I don't know. We watch Netflix, okay? I'm not sure everybody watches. But I'm using it as an example of an international media outlet. The Palestinian story is very, very much present. The Jewish story has always been very present. Fiddler on the Roof, Exodus, we can name any of a number of films that really formed how people thought and not in good ways, okay? In Exodus, if you remember, uh, there was the bad Arabs and the good Arabs. The good Arabs were those that collaborated with the Jews, okay? Um, Fiddler on the Roof was the heartbreaking story of the shtetl and the breakup of the shtetl. So very important. But this now is also coming, to, what is coming to the, to, the, to the screen is also the Palestinian, Oh, the Palestinian story. I just watched last week and I recommend it highly, although I just spoke to somebody who hated it and switched it off after 10 minutes. I thought it was, it was funny. It was human. It was moving. A, a series called Mo. Mo is short for Muhammad. Uh, and it's a, a man from a Palestinian family who lives in the States and just has a, a regular life. But really it's putting the narrative out there with the flashbacks, with the memories of his grandmother. So again, in very human ways, I think that we are moving forward. We don't see the fruit yet, but I am not completely pessimistic about things changing. Let's just hope that it's not too late, uh, that we can still uh, change things enough for the people who are suffering right now. Thank you, David. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but um, our time has run short. David, thank you for your time, your scholarship, and your balanced presentation. You have given us a solid foundation in the history of Israel-Palestine. There's much for us to process. We join you in the prayer that this struggle will end. To all of our uh, listeners, please join us on October 26th for Indigenous People, Reconciliation and the Catholic Church with Dr. Peter Bazan, SJ, and Rosella Kinoshimeg, DOS and Indigenous Leader. And on December 13th, join us for Slavery and Racism in Church History with Christopher Kellerman, SJ. Thanks to Jose, Fanny, and our translators, Michelle and Albert, for, as always, ensuring everything technical was working. And I'll turn it over to Jose. Thank you, David, and thank you, Pat. Uh, just a couple of reminders. As Pat uh, has said, uh, there's a few sessions coming up uh, from now until December, and the details for those sessions will be shared with you via email when they become available uh, very soon. Uh, second reminder, as we've said before, the recordings of all sessions will be shared with those who registered by three business days after the webinar. And finally, oh no, that was it, uh, just the recordings three days uh, after, three business days after the session. Thank you very much, Pat and, and David, and everyone who attended. Thank you. Thank you.